Dr. Mary Davis is an associate professor here at BYU in the Microbiology and Molecular Biology Department. She received her bachelor's in clinical laboratory science here at BYU and then went on to Vanderbilt University where she received her master's in applied statistics as well as her PhD in human genetics. While at Vanderbilt, Dr. Davis began researching how genetics can predict the severity of multiple sclerosis in individuals and provide better aid to patients. She has since been studying multiple sclerosis for 15 years. Her lab currently focuses on two major projects, extraction, extraction of detailed clinical data from electronic me medical records and the genetic analysis of autoimmune diseases. Projects in both of these areas focus on multiple sclerosis, diabetes, and other complex disorders. Dr. Davis credits her passion for women's health to her time working in a hospital, as well as her time as a patient after her pregnancies. Please welcome Dr. Mary Davis. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here today and to be able to share some of my research and things that I've learned. So um, as I, as, just as, as she mentioned, I have, I have a few different interests in what I research. One is that um, I am very interested in human genetics, how your variants in your genome affect um, what your health and your um, life course. And then I'm also interested in how we can repurpose clinical data for research, especially electronic health records. And then I'm also very interested in common diseases. So when I first learned about genetic, human genetics, I thought more of the Mendelian diseases that we talked about, where you either have it or you don't have it. Um, it's dominant or recessive. Some of you, those terms may be familiar. But I've really come to love studying common diseases that affect more people, and it's not as easy to predict who has it or not. So, and the more I've studied, done research, the more, too, I've really um, come to realize how often these patients that have these chronic lifelong diseases, if they want research done, not only do they go to a doctor for all their appointments, but if they want research to be done, they have to also enroll in other clinical trials or other research studies and re-get all of that data collected. So I'm very passionate about how can we use what's already been collected clinically to help with the research and also reduce the burden on those patients with diseases so they don't have to be monitored multiple times. So some of those common diseases um, include our autoimmune diseases. And so this is a study, um, and I'll show you some things from my research and some things for just in general, but we see a lot of sex bias in autoimmune diseases. So you see with Schrogen syndrome, it's almost exclusively in females. Um, lupus, this is the most common type of lupus, um, is mostly females. I'm studying multiple sclerosis, which you can see has a bias, a strong bias towards females. So why MS? What, why, why do we care so much about this? So this is, is an autoimmune disease. It's a demyelinating disease of your central nervous system. So if you, you think of your nerves, and that's how your brain and your central nervous system transmits data to the rest of your body to tell your hands to move, your fingers to move, to talk, your, um, your, your, all of your body systems. And to make it go faster, there's actually something called myelin sheaths around different parts of it, and the electrical impulse jumps those to get there fast. In multiple sclerosis, the body targets those myelin sheaths and degrades it. So instead, the um, electrical impulse can't jump those to get there faster. They have to take the long way, which you can imagine makes it difficult to walk, makes it difficult to see, all of these different things. So. Um, this is a, I like to call it a quintessential complex disease, both because the causes of it are very complex. So you can have genetic or factors from your environment, such as smoking, um, viral infections that you've had, how far you live from the equator actually makes a difference. And if you develop MS or not, there are, there's almost no incidence of MS if you're born and raised at the equator. The farther you get from it, the higher your risk of MS. So a um, lot of things going on. That. We also know there's a strong genetic component. It's not as strong as a, as a Mendelian disorder, but genetics do play a big role in there. So if you get MS or not, it's very complex. It's also very complex once you're diagnosed with the disease, what your life will look like and what symptoms you'll have, how you'll respond to treatment. You can have two patients with multiple sclerosis 
that have, that have no, no overlapping, overlapping characteristics. characteristics. So, so, we can hear me twice now. Um, how, do, how does it matter when you have this disease? How do you know what your life will be like? You're diagnosed typically in your early years, so in your 20s or early 30s, and it's a lifelong disease. So patients might have this for 60 years. So typically when you go in and you're diagnosed with something, your first question is often like, what does this mean for me? How will this impact my life? What can I expect in the future? And really with MS, right now the doctor can't tell you. Usually what they can say is, well, let's see how you do for the first two or three years. If it's really bad, it'll probably be really bad forever. If it's not too bad, it probably won't be too bad forever. But at the same time, those first two or three years are the most important years for treatment that can change the outlook on your life for the rest of your life. So we really need that information immediately, even though it's not available. And I would like to help change that. Um, the other thing too is that this is also a disease mostly impacting women during childbearing years. And pregnancy and childbirth <clears throat> has an impact on, on the disease and how it works. So how do we help women, especially with this disease? How do we know how to help them prepare? How do we know how to help them in family planning? How, what difference will it make if you have a severe disease or not? What medication should you take? Is it worth taking the effective but riskier medications for you? So with this, um, we've used two different data sets. Historically, I've used a lot of the electronic health records from Vanderbilt University. Um, and so there we have information on the, we have the doctor's notes to type up. A 63-year-old woman came in today complaining of this or for her annual appointment for multiple sclerosis. We also have um, their laboratory results. Every time you go to the doctor, they use a, a sign a specific code to tell your insurance how much to pay them. And those codes are related to different diseases and procedures that you have. Um, we also get images mostly for multiple sclerosis. MRI is how it's, how it's diagnosed, looking at lesions in your brain and spinal cord. So, um, so Vanderbilt and the BioView, it's, it's de-identified, meaning that they remove names and adjust dates. But anybody who's ever gone to Vanderbilt University Medical Center clinic is in um, the synthetic derivative, the de-identified medical record. However, if you've had your blood drawn there, after a certain number of days, blood is disposed of, and you can use leftover blood. And now this is an often procedure, but um, the leftover blood, they actually take and extract white blood cells and pull out and do the look at the genetics of the patient and store it connected to their medical records. So that's a really great place to use data. I also have recently started using something called the All of Us data set. So the, a buzzword right now is precision medicine. And really what this means is that when you go into the doctor, that you Instead of just being told, okay, you have this disease, there's an 80% chance this medication will work. Or if you're looking at something like antidepressants, there's a 50% chance that the first medication you try will be effective. Precision medicine means that for you, based on your genetics, based on the symptoms you have, I know exactly what the right drug is for you. So that's an example of precision medicine. We do this a lot in cancer patients. We sequence their tumor and we know exactly which chemotherapy will be effective for them. But what if we could do that for everything? How many of you go to the doctor and feel like you go for help on something and you go back repeatedly, like, okay, this didn't work, and so you try something else, you try something else. How much harder is that, especially if you are a young female trying to finish college, if you're having children, trying to make decisions in the future, or if even if, you know, if you're a man and you're in like the prime of your career, but you have to go on disability because you can't work. What if we can give them better information so when they're diagnosed, they have a better quality of life, make more informed decisions? So at this point, I can't advance my slides, but that's okay. We'll just move forward anyway. So a couple things that we, are, that we have been looking at. So we're using these two different data sets. So the United States has, government has 
um, an initiative to create a database for all of this information. So it's very easy to access um, across medical records across the country. So for Vanderbilt, if they go to a different clinic for something, I don't have their medical record. However, if they go, oh, we're advancing now. Um, if they go anywhere in the United States and they choose to be part of this precision medicine initiative, I get all of the electronic, all of their electronic health records are involved there. We also sequence their whole genome. Um, so just a little bit of follow-up from before is that with um, MS, there is a three to one ratio of female to male. However, initially when MS was first, about 1900s when we first started diagnosing patients with MS, early on, really they decided, they felt like it was a disease that men got. And then over the years, they realized actually that wasn't true. They were mostly just looking at men to diagnose it because they were the ones in the workforce that had to go on disability due to MS. So there's, there's always been a, there's, there's a belief now that it's always been heavily female. We just were not looking and diagnosing and treating women. That being said, we are seeing um, a change in the most recent decades when we don't think it's due to just who we're checking, that more, that the ratio is getting bigger. So there are actually, um, I believe it's Sweden, the ratio has always been about four and a half to five women to men being diagnosed with MS, and that has held steady. But in other developed countries like Canada and the United States, it's been around like two and a half to three, and that is going up. And we don't know why. And so there's a few things that we have looked at for this. So just another piece of information about this disease I want to let you have is that once you're diagnosed, you're put into really two main categories. You know, I have three up here. There's really two main ones. One is if you just have the disease and you're diagnosed and you just progressively get worse, that's considered primary progressive or PPMS. However, the majority of patients, about 80 to 85 of MS patients, have relapses where they're perfectly fine and then they might wake up one morning and be paralyzed on half one side of their body or have severe pain in their eyes or have blurry vision. Um, and then after a period of time, it resolves. And then they might be just like they were before or maybe they'll have a little bit of lingering disability, but it's, it's much improved. This is called relapsing remitting MS. Um, after a period of time, almost, basically all individuals relapse and remitting, usually it's about 20 years, 20 to 30 years, will convert into secondary progressive, where it looks more like primary progressive. They're not usually having those big relapses, but they're steadily getting worse. So how is this disease different between men and women? Here are just a couple examples of how they're different. Generally, women tend to have more symptoms in their eyes. Men tend to have more symptoms with their muscles. Again, this is very general, but we do see some differences in what symptoms present. Women tend to have more relapses than men. Um, however, if you talk about just disability progression, it tends to be faster for men. So even though women are having relapses at periods of intense disability, general progression tends to be faster in men. Generally, women onset a lot earlier than men, up to 10 years earlier on average, and that's our 3-1 ratio for relapse and remitting. However, primary progressive MS um, tends to be a 1-to-1 -one ratio of men to women, and, but men, again, do progress faster. Um, conversion to the progressive form of the disease, which is in some ways more debilitating, and we have less that we can do to assist. Usually it's later for women than men, but that's probably because men are just diagnosed later. It's probably the same age that they're converting. We also see that, now I'll talk about this figure on the right later, but basically you can see that the disease progression and relapses for women varies based on which part of um, puberty they're at in their life as well as pregnancy. So we know that there are some hormones involved. We see other differences for men and women, including, and these are based on just general characteristics. In general, men tend to be willing to go on medications with a higher risk of side effects or more serious side effects than women. Um, so we do see more of those treatments for men. But at the same time, 
a lot of MS treatments have pretty severe side effects. This is autoimmune, so the treatments are suppressing the immune system, which means you can get severe infections. At the same time, the compliance or likelihood a patient stays on the medication that they chose is the same for men and women. Um, we also have seen some of the original clinical studies for MS treatments. They actually saw some differences in men and women, the efficacy of them, but that never made it to clinic on when they prescribed them, and nobody really knows that data. So that's another area where there needs to be, and then it's been 30 years and no one's looked into it anymore. So we have a lot more data about that available. Here's just one other one. We do see that there are, we do see some differences. Um, one thing I'll say is that there is a risk factor. Smoking is an in, environmental risk factor for MS. We are seeing increasing rates of smoking in women across the world, and that could account for a little bit of that difference um, in of women having higher rates of MS. Um, however, vitamin D, if you have, um, low vitamin D, you have a high risk for MS, but estrogen actually produces more production of vitamin D, so we know that's one that, that doesn't affect it. Um, we see differences in BMI, and BMI is a risk factor for MS. Okay, it's not advancing again. Oh, there we go. Um, we, again, these are just things that I've already talked about. Men are more likely to have faster debility, disability accumulation in primary progressive, in, sorry, in relapse, but not in primary progressive. So this is a little bit different than what we saw in another study. But we are seeing differences in men and women. All right, we mentioned these data sets already. Um, so I want to talk, a lot of my studies are specifically looking at genetics. How can we use genetics to predict for a specific patient what their disease will be like? So we want to include gender, we want to include biological sex, but we also want to include their genetics, how does that affect them? We've known since 1970s that there is one major genetic risk factor, the HLA DRB1501 variant, that accounts for about 30% of your genetic risk for MS. About a third of your chance genetically of getting MS is based on this variant. And everyone was really excited, and a lot of research went into MS genetics. And absolutely nothing was found that could be shown and replicated for 30 years until we kind of changed the way we did our studies instead of looking at families, we actually brought in samples from all across the world and we compared MS patients to non-MS patients. So a case control study, not based on families. And um, I was, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to have worked in this. The International Multiple Sclerosis Genetics Consortium is a fantastic consortium that has worked, one of the very first large genetic consortiums formed that has been very proactive in saying, we don't care who gets the credit, let's work together, we want to help patients with MS. Now this is a little older figure, but it's less messy than the most new one. We now know there are over 200 other genes involved in if you develop multiple sclerosis or not. So when I say this is a complex disorder, the genetics are very complex. But even all 200 of those don't add up to the amount that the other HLA variant does. So we still aren't really sure the rest of it. So at this point, I spent um, a lot of my early years in MS in helping to identify variants associated with if you de develop the disease or not. But I knew based on my clinical experience that it doesn't really help me if someone tells me, oh, genetically, that's probably why you got MS. And I'm like, well, I have it. Like, that doesn't change my life. What can I do with that? So based on my clinical experience is why I really want to say, how do I help these people's lives? How do I help especially women when they're going through all of these changes in their life, and especially with pregnancy and other things, how do I help them know how to best work, on, work with their doctor for their disease? Okay, so just a couple of things. BMI tends to be higher. It's a risk, high BMI is risk factor for MS. However, once disease progresses, it goes lower. Um, we did look at variants that will predict your BMI at diagnosis and at the, as far into your disease as we have, and also how big that changes. And we really saw that the first visit, the BMI at, um, at the beginning was associated with variants, genes involved in depression. 
and that those involved in your BMI at the end were involved in autoimmune disease pathways, genes known to be involved in that. So that was really informative. We looked across male and female, and our graphs are a lot bigger for our females, but that's because we have a lot more patients that are female. So the distribution is fairly similar across men and women. So we didn't see a big difference there um, on there. We also, depression is a very common comorbidity or accompanying disease condition with multiple sclerosis. We've also now seen that it's more common to see before you even get the MS diagnosis. And there are many genetic variants associated with if you develop depression. So we wanted to look specifically in MS patients. So this is a study done um, by, by collaborators um, at Case Western University where we looked at depression with genetic and other environmental risk factors. This is the first of two studies we did. The APOE variant, has anybody heard of APOE before? This is your largest risk factor for you get Alzheimer's disease or not. And so, but it's been shown to be, it shows up in other things. But we actually see, um, this graph is showing that the far, the quicker the line goes down, this is basically your survival without depression if you have MS. If you have a specific genotype at this gene, and it's actually one that increases risk for Alzheimer's, you're, there's much less chance that you'll get MS without depression, all right? But we also looked at other risk factors. We looked at obesity. We looked at other physical disorders. Again, smoking and um, congestive, I'm blanking, pulmonary disorder um, are very high risk factors too. But we do see that specifically for MS, there are variants unique for depression. We looked at this in a different agnostic study looking at specific genes. Um, and my student, Will Brueger, led the, the work on this. Um, and we actually found that there is a specific variant in NEGR1 that is associated with developing a depression in patients with MS. We didn't see any differences, oops, wrong button, um, in gender on this, but we did see that this can be predictive. So our next question was, what about postpartum depression? So we're looking at women, uh, the people that usually have MS tend to, be, tend to be women, and it's during childbearing years. And there is associate, if you have major depressive disorder, you're more most likely to have postpartum depression, but not necessarily. And this has really been an understudied topic. Um, it's something that I do feel very passionate about, is that the mental health, well, mental and physical health of women after they have a baby is something we need to do better at as a society and helping them. But especially postpartum depression is something we're talking about now. So in general, um, it's, not, it's, it's not looked at that much in any case study. Um, these are some things that we have found in immune-mediated um, disorders, so that's the IMED. And so multiple sclerosis is one. We see rheumatic disorders um, here, so that's like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, and allergic rhinitis is considered an IMED as well. You can see that for, this is an odds ratio. So if you have MS, are you more or less likely than the general population to get postpartum depression? What we see is that if you have MS, you're two times as likely as, as a woman without MS who's had a baby to get postpartum depression. That's a pretty high risk factor. And it's higher than any other of these immune-mediated diseases. So there's something, it's not just the inflammation in your body, it's not just the autoimmune component um, that is causing there to be higher risk of postpartum depression. And right now, we don't know why. There's no data on that. There's no information. So this is something that we are looking at. Um, we've done a lot of studies and um, done some review articles. There, there is some indication specifically the sex hormones and how it's interacting with the immune system and the inflammation um, to cause postpartum depression. But right now we're in the middle of looking for specific genetic variants that can predict if a woman is at very high risk with MS at that higher risk. So maybe there's some women based on genetics that it's like they have a 10 times higher risk of just getting postpartum depression than general. And maybe other women don't have that genetic variant. So maybe they have just the normal risk of postpartum depression. Can we get more precise? Can we get to that precision medicine? 
And so this is something that um, Alex O'Dell in my lab and undergraduate has been working on, is very passionate about. So I told you we get back to the postpartum, uh, we get back to this figure. So a patient with MS, before and after reproductive years, their, their risk of MS and severity is the same as men. It's during those reproductive years that we get this big difference in them. Um, and specifically looking at relapse. So that's when you have that intense period of disability that will resolve. But at the same time, do you really want to not be able to use your legs for three months? How would that impact you going to school, taking care of a newborn baby, um, going on a study abroad, you know, taking care of your parents, interacting in life in any way that you want to, right? Um, or if it affects your right arm and you're a pianist, how's that going to affect you? So actually what we see is that during pregnancy, the rate of relapses is drastically decreased from the rest of your life. That is usually when MS patients do the best. And that's because your immune system is suppressed so that you won't attack the baby. However, you can see how large this green box is here. The first trimester after having a baby, a woman is at much, much, much greater risk of a relapse than any other time in her life. Okay. And that's known, and you can see at the bottom, we're looking at estrogen and progesterone, different hormone levels, and you can see those kind of correlate with these, these trends. Um, you know, here's another graph just showing that you're, how many relapses a year you have before you have a baby, during pregnancy, it goes really down low. That first trimester, it goes really high, and then it goes back down to normal. So how, what do you do? And really right now what's done is you can't be on MS, most MS medications during pregnancy due to risk of the baby. It's also generally not considered safe for most of them to be on them while breastfeeding. So women with MS are encouraged in general to not breastfeed. So it's the day they deliver they can go back on their MS medications to prevent this relapse. Um, and that's a really hard decision to make on there. And especially because these relapses, you might be out for two or three months. But maybe you won't have one. And you'd rather breastfeed your baby because there's a lot of benefit to that. As well as you're recovering from having a baby and your whole body being affected. What do you choose? And, and let's be honest, I firmly believe pregnancy brain is a true thing. All those hormones and everything affects your brain. So in your most vulnerable state, you have to make these decisions. Um, and these relapses, not only do they... You, they resolve, but they don't always resolve, and sometimes you're often you're left with a specific disability for the rest of your life based on this. Um, and there, there's no data. Right now they just say, go right back on the medications as soon as you can. So this is something specifically that we're also, I just need to figure out which button I'm actually pushing, um, that we're looking right now and we're doing a gen genome-wide association study looking for genetic variants to predict. And then that, if we can see, Gen it's a big genetic variant, or we're also looking at um, relapses prior to pregnancy, number of pregnancies, maybe there's not as high risk on your first baby, but high risk later, things like that. We're looking to see, can we use genetics or other variants that a doctor can use to predict and help inform the patient as they make that decision about what to do about medication after childbirth. We're also looking specifically into um, miscarriages, pregnancies that end in a stillbirth and see how all those other variants impact this risk factor to help the woman and the doctor have a more informed conversation. Okay, the last story I want to tell you about is, um, I told you a lot of these medications, some of them are very safe, some of them have a high risk of um, disease. The Historically, the frontline treatments have been very safe, but only effective in about 30 to 50% of people who try them. they are also in self-injections that are very painful and have flu-like symptoms for 24 hours, and you might have to do it three times a week. Um, but it makes a difference if you start them early. However, these are safe unless you're part of the small minority that it makes your liver fail, which is a bit of a problem, right? So for most patients, it's not a worry. But if you're part of that, you know, 0.1% that your liver fails, that is a big problem, right? How many of you at 25 years old want your liver to fail? So we were looking for genetic predictors or pharmacogenetics of how to identify if you're in this small category that has really big effects. So we actually were able to find um, a variant 
in this gene R IRF6 that was highly associated. We were able to replicate this using collaborators from Canada, and we used three different data sets that we've showed it over and over. If you have a specific variant here, then you have five times the risk of developing um, liver failure. So that's something that on its own has not made it to clinic. They can't use that right now. I get MS doctors calling me and it's not there yet. But this is one step towards my goal is that when you've di you're diagnosed with MS, that the doctor can order an MS genetic panel and you get back all of this data at the beginning. Which medications do you have a risk for severe side effect? Which medications will be effective? Are you going to be a severe pro fast progressor? Are you going to have a higher rate of um, relapses postpartum? What's your risk of depression? And then your whole treatment plan and your whole disease plan will be based on, on that genetics and other information that you have. Um, so we saw this, however, in science research, most of the time, vast majority of the time, research is done on males and of European descent. Most mouse studies, they use only the male mice to reduce confounding, um, which is a problem. And also in humans especially, we see a lot more women represented in human studies, but it's almost 95% of our people we've analyzed are from European descent, which is a big problem. So I, I am not talking too much today, but we, we see that there are differences, especially in women who have African genetic ancestry in how their MS disease presents. And there's very little research. So we are working in multiple data sets trying to do this. So um, Will is one of my, he's now a PhD student, but he did this as an undergrad. But he actually took that same study we did for the liver injury in Europeans, and we have a small sample size because it, this disease, historic, it, more, women, more people of European descent have MS, but there's now becoming a higher chance of being diagnosed with MS if you're, if you're considered black. Um, and what we found is that this variant, in, and this is a small sample size, it was associated. So this is really big because a lot of genetic studies don't look in any population besides Europeans. And at the same time, when somebody does, they often don't replicate. So how does a doctor use that information? So this is one reason that we've moved to this new database. It's very large. The United States, you can join it if you want to. You can Google All of Us Research Program. They'll give you your whole genome sequence back for free. Um, happy to talk with you about it. There's 716,000. There are right now 2,700 that have multiple sclerosis and have whole genome sequence data available and everything else. Um, so we're, we're analyzing them right now. And you can see, again, we see more individuals who are white, but we have a pretty good sample size. So up until about um, five years ago, across the world, we had about 60,000 European MS samples uh, individuals and studies, and we only had a thousand of black or African American. And so even adding another 300 does change the ability to study. And then specifically, we're looking at this specific treatment, this interferon beta, and we need to look at their lab values for liver treatment. And you see we've got 300 that have all that data. Um, and then specifically, you can see we are, and we're specifically interested um, and comparing in our male and female. And you can see we do have a very high ratio of these as female. So I'm going to skip these. These are just in case you know we have extra time. But we've done a lot of different things and aspects of looking at MS um, and, and how we use medical records, how we analyze the data, how we help, how we help patients. And we're just seeing more and more how important it is that we include um, specifically biological sex in these analyses and um, what we do with that. So I just want to acknowledge, I've had a lot of students work with me and especially um, Stephen or Will Brueger um, has done a lot of these analyses and he's working right now on a lot of them for his PhD. And then Alex and Caden are both currently in my lab and are excited to be working on postpartum depression and relapses. Um, 
there are several places we receive funding. The All of Us program, especially want to thank the participants there because without individuals contributing their data, we wouldn't be able to learn about humans. Humans aren't like mice. We can't control them, who they breed with and how many pups they have and what food they eat. Um, and then especially the MLIB Wells Grant. And I just put this up here too because these are actually due for affiliate faculty um, at the end of this month. And this actually funded all of our um, things that we've done, especially looking at branching into the postpartum and being able to get into this new all of us data set. Um, and I am happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Dr. Mary Davis's research on multiple sclerosis shows how important it is to view different health conditions through the lens of women. The intersection between women and healthcare is significant and impacts the lives of females everywhere. Women's health is not merely a concern, it is a paramount issue in building a better society. As we learned from Dr. Davis, women are disproportionately affected by multiple sclerosis. This often is an overlooked aspect of this complex neurological condition. Dr. Davis's research highlights a comprehensive approach to care and support women with multiple sclerosis. When we view this condition through the lens of women, we can take into account things that exclusively affect women, like reproductive health, familial dynamics, and hormones. By viewing MS as intersectionality with women, we can better understand how this condition affects women differently. By acknowledging the unique challenges that women face, we can more adequately provide healthcare services for women's conditions. Dr. Davis's advocacy for MS is powerful. We can learn from her research how to build better support systems for women's health and raise awareness about issues that predominantly affect women. Going forward, we can continue to advocate for women's health issues and foster greater relationships among researchers, healthcare professionals, and women. Additionally, we can continue to advocate for women's health in many different spheres. It is so important for us to continually recognize the role of gender in medical research and treatment. We each play an essential role in helping women have greater access to health care and better health care services. Hopefully, as students, we can take what we have learned this afternoon and apply it to our research and studies to make a difference in the lives of women everywhere. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for your powerful presentation this afternoon and for your dedication to women's health. We will now turn the time over to Lauren for our Q&A portion. Okay, so for the Q&A portion, if you have a question, we invite you to come up and speak into the microphone so we can all hear you. Um, Abby is monitoring the Zoom, so if you're on Zoom, please uh, comment your question in the chat. Um, but I'll start us off with my first question. So um, as a female college student with an autoimmune disease, what would you suggest with limit, the limited resources I have, my interaction like with my doctor, what would you suggest to, to navigate that? Yeah, it's a great question. And it, it doesn't have a fantastic answer, but the number one thing that I would do is I would initiate discussions with your doctor about what they know about differences in gender in that specific disease. Are they following current literature? Have they been to a conference and heard a discussion about new research that's happening? And then I would also, my background is science. Um, there are some things, if your background is not science, that you can learn some of the basic stuff so that you can search to see if there is a new study or publication on gender that you can then take to your doctor and ask him to help you with. So, and right now, really, most things come down to the basics. Try and manage your stress. Try to manage, um, eat healthy, right? Don't smoke. Get some sleep. But I think that especially as women, those two of um, lowering your stress level and getting sufficient sleep are very hard for women to feel like it's okay to prioritize that in my life. And so I think especially as female, that would be really important is prioritizing those and knowing it's best for me and it's best for those around me if I prioritize those and don't let guilt or things allow me to get to, to lose those. We have a question from someone on Zoom um, that asked, what accommodations should the government work and or schools be providing for people with MS considering it really is a debilitating disease? So accommodations are something that is also really hard for MS because the disease is so different for each person. So, so something that affects your eyes, you're going to need different accommodations than if it affects your limbs. 
And one thing I will say is that childhood onset MS is fairly rare. So usually it's going to be something that um, you'll see a subset of individuals if they're in college, you know, in the standard 18 to 22, 24 range. Um, but a lot is going to affect those maybe that have come back to school or things like that, or right as you're graduating and choosing your first job. So again, that will just be dependent. And I think that the big thing is to make sure that you are diagnosed and you are seeing a specialist in MS. Um, and especially if you see a specialist that is willing to look at your whole body and all your symptoms that come along with MS, rather than just lesions in your brain. Um, how is like precision medicine complicated by like insurance? Because I know a lot of insurance want you to go through the whole process of taking this drug and then this drug and then this drug. So is there a way to make it so that insurances see precision medicine as Yes, something? there is. The easiest is the, the biggest way that precision medicine has been shown in clinics is because genetics. And there are other things that should be taken into account for precision medicine. But from what I've observed, if you have a genetic risk factor that you can show, drug will not work or it will. And part of that's most drugs when you take them are not in the active form. Your body has to break them down to get to the active form. And there are variants that your gene to metabolize them doesn't work. And so in those cases, you can submit the genetics to allow them, and they will move you for different types of um, medications. Not always. But so that's one reason why I feel like genetics is a really great place to kind of push on precision medicine is because it's easy numbers. Hi. Do you find that the gender of the doctor of MS patients affects the type of care they receive or more adequately addressing their unique symptoms based on their gender? Yes. So I don't know that that's been studied for MS. That's not something that my data sets I can study because the doctor's names are de-identified as well and nowhere in the medical record does it store the gender of the doctor. However, there are many studies that have looked at care, especially for chronic and complex diseases that show that female clinicians are more likely to listen and to hear all of the symptoms and be able to, the patient to be able to receive better care. All right, please join me in thanking Dr. Davis again.